Uh, so our next speaker probably knows more Egyptian hieroglyphics than she does in the This is true. <laughs> and um, this is part of the context track. So there are three tracks in this conference. Tracks, they're themes. Uh, one is uh, context. The other one is code, so like all about coding and programming. And the other is, is I call it career, just that I see, but it's business, right? It's the, the first talk was in the business theme. And so the context one, I asked Will if he could give a talk, because software is changing the world. It's a new medium that hasn't been around that long. And we don't know exactly how it's going to change our lives. But what we can do is look to other media and how to change the world and history. And so why not go back all the way to the beginning of history, to the invention of writing. And so that is why I asked Will to speak. Will Bird is a friend of the Chodra community. Um, he created Mini Conran, which is what Core Logic is based on. And he's also working on Barlamin, which will replace us all in the future. As a, as a programmer that's better than us. Well, anyway, thank you, Will Bird. Thank you. And I, I should point out that all the work I've done is with other people, except for what I'm going to show you today. All me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so many cameras for you and the other people, including Dan Street. Same with Carl. But. Now for something different. So uh, Eric has known for a while that I'm interested in, in history of writing. Uh, my, my language skills are pretty weak. Uh, some of my friends make fun of me. They say I'm a programming language researcher, but I only know one programming language scheme. I mean, I know other languages, but I refuse to program anything other than scheme. Uh, and, and basically, the only natural language I know is English. Uh, but I, I'm very interested, not so much just in language, but in writing. Uh, so, so Alan Kay and I think many other people have claimed that writing is the most important invention humans have ever come up with. Uh, and I, I believe that's probably true. So uh, I'm really fascinated by the history of writing, and in particular, uh, the origins of writing. And uh, I also think the writing uh, for some of these systems, is extremely beautiful. Uh, I really love ancient Egyptian. I really love uh, cuneiform, Sumerian, Akkadian, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and when I first went to school, uh, when I went to college, I was at the University of Chicago, and I didn't want to take Spanish because I had like done so poorly. So I decided to take an advanced graduate course in Babylonian, <laughs> which went about as well as you might expect. You know, the, the, uh, other, the, the other students in the class, the, uh, the grad student and majoring in comparative linguistics, would be like, oh, is that the uh, case like in Hebrew or Aramaic? And I'd be like, is that like Spanish? <laughs> The professor was like, no, it's not like Spanish. But anyway, it hasn't, hasn't stopped me uh, from, from being interested in these systems, especially the writing. So I've, I've taught myself uh, a little bit of Egyptian and a little bit of Babylonian. Babylonian as a language isn't that hard. Uh, the writing system is very difficult to use. The language itself is it's a Semitic language, and it's, it's not that different from, from learning Hebrew, for example. OK, so Eric asked me to to talk about something about the history of writing and, and programming and you know, what, what in the world do you talk about? I have no idea. So, so I, I just started reading as much as I could. Uh, I used it as sort of an excuse to geek out. And also, I've been in England a fair amount recently. So I, I, uh, every time I go to England now, I just get the hotel room next to the British Museum. I've also been to Oxford and Cambridge recently, so I like I've hit up the uh, Ashmolean Museum in Oxford a few times. So this is uh, some cuneiform writing from the British Museum, and let's see. So this is uh, let's see. I'm not sure how old this particular one is, but it's it's pretty old. Okay, so it's carved in, in stone. Um, 
you know, here is, by, by the way, my, my slides are just like photos I've taken and stuff like that, so they're not the most organized, but, uh, so I'll just kind of talk around it. But um, here, here's another piece I'm very interested also in ceramic. So, so obviously if you have writing on stone, that lasts a long time. If you have ceramics, you can have complicated artwork. Right? That lasts a long time, so this is, that's, uh, I think it's like 2,500 years old. Uh, so here you see some ceramic uh, pieces, and you can see that whoever made the ceramics, or actually, I'm not sure if this is the person who made the ceramics, or if it's someone afterwards carving into it. Um, but you know, they could write something, inscribe it in the, the pottery, and this will last thousands of years. Uh, so here are some cuneiform tablets, and you know, so these are close to 4,000 years old, and. You know, so this is the Sumerian king list. Uh, so that's that's almost four thousand years old. Okay. So then you just go to the Ashmolean Museum and sitting there, play. Uh, this is another. You know, so so the, the Sumerians and, and the Babylonians didn't just write on the flat tablets. They also had these sort of prism structures and these nail-looking type things. So so this is. Uh, inscriptions talking about mathematics, they have inscriptions talking about astronomy, uh, so forth. So you know, th these are preserved for, for very uh, long periods of time. And then this is, uh, this is very, very old writing from the Sumerians. Um, this is sort of accounting information. And yeah, so this is uh, about 5,200 years old. Okay. So 5,200 years old. Uh, so I, I was thinking a lot about these ancient writings, and also uh, another fun thing. Oh yeah, so here's this is really really old writing. Uh, this is apparently sort of proto chemia form, I think, for beer. Uh, and yeah, so so once again, yeah, so this is like a, a five thousand years old. Uh, and and you can also see these sorts of masterworks. Okay, so this is a. Greek vase, you can look at, I mean, it looks like it was made yesterday, but this is thousands of years old. Okay, and now we come to the modern world. And so as I'm doing these things, as I'm, as I'm reading up and, and learning and thinking and visiting these museums, uh, I also do things like get emails from Google uh, saying that they're going to shut down my, my account and delete all my data. So don't want your account or your data? If you don't want this Google Apps account and don't want to save any of your data, you don't need to do anything. It'll take care of itself, right? So, um, you know, they, they give their justification for, for doing it, but, you know, what happens to your account? Basically, all your information is gone forever, destroyed forever. Uh, and then you can find some interesting websites. This is from Vermont, but this is a Google memorial to all of the services that Google has shut down. Uh, they couldn't all fit on the screen. Okay. Uh, and, and I don't particularly mean to pick on Google. Uh, this is not really, you know, this is not just a Google phenomenon. So uh, the Internet Archives archive team, uh, run by Jason Scott, keeps this death watch of all the services and websites that are likely to go down. So here's, here's their likely to die list. Okay. And they're keeping an eye on these, these websites and maybe archiving them. Uh, so this is a partial list of all the sites and services that shut down in 2014. Yeah, couldn't fit it on the page, of course. And then this is kind of the thing that got Jason Scott really involved in this, is the GeoCities shutdown. You know, if you remember GeoCities, that was a big chunk of the web, the early web. And people had their GeoCities uh, pages. And uh, you know, Yahoo just shut it down. And apparently they gave, their notice was uh, you know, like a little aside in an FAQ <laughs> saying this, this service is going to be shut down in two months or three months or whatever. Uh, so, you know, so Jason Scott and you know, this archive team managed to pull down much of GeoCities, and several other teams also tried to archive it. Uh, and so if you go to Internet Archive, you can find their special collection from 2009 for 
for Jews. Uh, and <laughs> it actually, if you go back and look at uh, uh, Sunset Abbey, yeah. archive team officially proclaims you, uh, Yahoo, the least trustable host and its arch enemy. Uh, prove us different or not. So, you know, th this is what I'm thinking about also or seeing uh, you know, while I'm reading about these documents that are thousands of years old. And uh, yeah, so I know a little, a little Egyptian. Let's see if I can find that. Uh, these aren't super organized. But um, anyway, the British Museum has uh, writing in, you know, uh, in Egyptian where I can read you know, King names just fine, that kind of thing. Okay, so, so I can still read writing that's uh, thousands of years old and uh, this, this was actually forgotten. Well, the, the language was forgotten. People didn't know how to read it. Uh, Egyptian. People didn't know uh, how to read Sumerian. People didn't know how to read Babylonian. So this information was lost for a long time. And only relatively recently was it rediscovered. And we're still trying to figure out how to read uh, Sumerian better. Uh, there are languages like Linear B that you can go to decipher. And then there are languages like Linear A, where we haven't been able to decipher them. Well, haven't we been able to decipher Linear A? Do you know that? Yeah, the sample size is really small. There's not enough of it, right? Okay. So, um, you, know, you know, there's this uh, saying that 90% you know, of life is showing up. Uh, I guess that's kind of true of history, too, right? So. 90% you know, of history is like showing up if, if, uh, if your language is forgotten and there's enough uh, pieces left, enough fragments, you know, people in the future, or maybe thousands of years in the future, at least have a chance to try to, to recover. Okay. But if you don't leave these pieces and it's gone, well, there's nothing you can do about it. And I started thinking a lot about how uh, when I was in elementary school, you know, I would write something down, and my parents still have my writings from elementary school. They still have my report cards from elementary school. But everything I did in high school and college is all gone, because I did it on a computer, I did it on a word processor. Um, and you know, some people say, well, you know, now we have the web, we have the cloud, right? But I think you know, the people at the archive team would, would say that that doesn't give us any safety guarantee maybe for a couple of years, but certainly not over time scales of even 10 years, and you know, definitely not over time scales of like a thousand years. Right? You know, so we might think our data is safe in GitHub, and GitHub's probably not going away tomorrow, but you know, can you really say that in the next 30 years, GitHub may not be acquired, or you know, some company that buys GitHub? Oh, yeah. Yahoo, yeah, Yahoo. Yahoo is going to buy GitHub, <laughs> right? To take all that Alibaba money. Um, yeah. So, so, it, it, and you know, obviously, people are aware of this problem. People are aware of this problem, and they're also aware that you know we have to be very careful with our media. You know, that, that our media can fail, hard drives fail, all these sorts of things. So, so I think there's an awareness of it, but. I think it doesn't go too far beyond awareness for most of us. If we have some awareness, like this could be a problem, uh, but I don't think we're acting like it's a problem or a potential problem. You know? And so wh when I'm looking at writing as 5,000 years old, I can't help but wonder how much of the stuff we're doing today will be around in 5,000 years, and how much of it is just going to be lost forever. Uh, so that, that sort of inspired me to, to start changing some of my own practices and thinking about my own practices. And I'm going to share, uh, share some of the changes I've made and some of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about and trying to work on. And uh, you know, interestingly enough, I thought this would be just kind of like some weird rabbit hole I go down that no one cares about. But many of the programmers I talk to think this is really interesting. I said, wow, why do you think this is interesting? He's like, well, you know, programmers get you know, excited about like keyboard switches or whatever, right? I mean, you know, there, there's certain types of input devices or certain certain uh, 
you know, if, if, you're, if your living is made by entering text, right, then it's, it's kind of natural to kind of care about your input devices or your screens or whatever. So, uh, to my surprise, uh, a number of programmers seem to be interested in this, and so I am going to uh, geek out a little bit and tell you about what I do, and uh, invite you to join me if you are interested. Uh, and um, this is definitely a project I'm working on actively, and I will be working on for the rest of my life. Uh, so, what have I decided to do? So, what I've decided to do is take it as sort of a personal challenge that uh, I want my research notes uh, and things like that to last at least 5,000 years and hopefully long. Okay? So that's, that's my task to myself. Because everything I do that I care about, I want to last at least 5,000 years. Okay? And it has the potential of lasting 5,000 years. So I want, I want the sort of equivalent of clay tablets or carved in stone or um, you know that that kind of thing. So the oldest uh, papyrus that's still extant is about 4,600 years old. The Egyptian papyrus is written on that we can read. It's about 4,600 years old. So you know, that's I think a, a reasonable target to kind of shoot at. So uh, well, how do you do that, right? You know, how do you how do you make sure that your research notes last 5,000 years or whatever? Uh, well, it's going to take some doing, maybe. So uh, the first thing I thought about was, well, I could try to store everything on like GitHub or whatever, right? You know, maybe that'll last 5,000 years. And that, I think <laughs> Jason Scott has disabused me of that notion. So, uh, well, what do I do instead? Uh, I become like the anti-Ted Nelson. So Ted Nelson, you know, has worked on the Xanadu project for a long time. And, and he is not a big fan of paper, of emulating paper on the computer. Okay? Uh, and, and I understand the reasons for this. So I'm not really anti-Ted Nelson. I mean, Ted Nelson's work is great. But it sort of will look like I'm anti-Ted Nelson because now I'm a computer scientist and I've gone back to paper. So for anything I care about, it has to be on paper. It can also be on a computer. In fact, it will also be on a computer. But it also has to be on paper. Uh, so uh, I've also gotten interested not just in you know, super high quality paper, but I've gotten very interested in inks and pens and papyrus and things like that. So here's some papyrus. Uh, I've got lots of stuff for people to check out afterwards if, if you're interested in this. So this is some papyrus I bought, the papyrus I bought online from Egypt. I don't think it's very high quality, so I bought a kit to make my own, but that also I think is not not really sufficient, right? Because I also want to kind of understand how these things are made. So did you know, I think it's at Lowe's, you can buy papyrus plants? So I'm going to start growing my own papyrus. <laughs> and then uh, my understanding is that the ancient Egyptian papyrus was actually very high quality. Very high quality. And they basically, I don't know if they intentionally did this, but they effectively did selective breeding for the papyrus. And we've lost that. So I'm going to start a breeding program to start breeding papyrus uh, to try to get back to you know, something that's decent. Uh, so that's <clears throat> that's one thing. But papyrus is actually kind of annoying to write on and has some some other issues. So I want some writings on papyrus, but I also want writings on on other media. And uh, one of the things I'm using now is uh, paper. And so the paper that I use is sort of not, not typical paper. Uh, you know, it's something you can buy, but you have to kind of look out for it. So this is what one of my notebooks look like today. So I make, sort of make my own. Uh, so basically what this is, is it's a spring-loaded thesis binder. You can use off Amazon or whatever. Um, and, and then I have paper, which is 100% cotton, um, acid-free, 24-pound wheat paper made by a company called Strathmore that makes very good paper for artists. So artists are people who care about things lasting a long time. So if you get into materials, you often find that the artists uh, are people who care about it. The other people who care about it are conservators and, and librarians, things like that, dealing with old manuscripts or old art collections and so forth. So this is the, the paper I use. <clears throat> and, well, what do you... You know, what do you write on? 
or I'm sorry, what, that's what I write on, but what do you write with? And what I've decided to do is uh, use fountain pens. So basically I carry a roll of fountain pens around, <laughs> but my go-to fountain pen is the Pilot 823 vacuum filler. I've got two of these, they're not cheap. Uh, but the reason I use these pens is that they are safe to carry on an airplane, not to use on an airplane, but to carry on an airplane because they're resistant to atmospheric pressure changes. And if you don't have a pen like that, then you will see that the ink can kind of explode a little over the place. So uh, I've got a special pen, a couple special pens, and then I use some special ink. So the ink I use is uh, what's called platinum brand carbon black ink. And this is the same sort of ink that the Egyptians used, basically the same sort of ink that the Egyptians used for the papyrus that lap, you know, this 4,600 years old. And this, this sort of ink um, should last not thousands of years, but tens of thousands of years. It'll last way longer than the paper. Uh, the, the thing that I'm not sure about is that you have to suspend the carbon in a binder. And I'm not sure what's in the binder. And most of these ink manufacturers will not tell you. So I've thought about, uh, uh, I've got some, some friends who run mass spec experiments. So I've thought about asking them <laughs> if they could run mass spec on the, the ink to try it. So, so basically, my, my, my theory is paranoia, right? This is sort of like security. <laughs> so uh, we're, you know, if, if, you're wanna, if you want to play this game, you have the ultimate enemy, which is time. And uh, time will find some way to destroy these things, right? So uh, it could be, you know, if you look at the history of ink, uh, during the Middle Ages, there was a type of ink called iron gall that was used uh, in the Western world. And there are many formulas for iron gall, but uh, many of those formulas turn out to be quite acidic. And iron gall ink changes with exposure to the atmosphere. Uh, and so there are manuscripts where the paper is in perfect uh, condition, but the area where the writing is is gone. Or someone drew a rectangle, and now there's a rectangle, a hole in the paper, and that kind of thing. So, uh, so I've, I've become extremely conservative. So you can get archival pens with archival ink, but they are only certified to 100 years. Uh, so you can get these Sakura art pens, for example. Uh, but then they, they age test them, accelerate age testing to 100 years, but that's you know, that's child's play. So <laughs> I don't I don't trust it, and the reason I don't trust it is because they don't tell you what the formula is. Like this is just like carbon, okay, tiny particles of carbon, and uh, I think we understand to some extent how that behaves. So if you've, if you've ever read uh, Neil Stevenson's novel Zodiac, the, the main character will not do any drug where the chemical formula is like, too complicated. Right? So it feels like you can't understand it. So that's kind of how I feel about these things. Like. 100% cotton paper, okay, I can kind of understand that. 100% um, carbon ink with a little bit of binder, okay, well maybe we can look at the binder and try to figure that out. And now it comes down to things like storage. How do you store that paper? And so I have an archival storage facility, which, was, which used to be my bedroom closet, uh, but I became a little worried about air circulation. So now I've kind of moved my setup outside of the closet and, but I have, uh, I have a monitoring system, so I monitor temperature and humidity. I have actually a wireless network in my apartment where I have my paper storage facility, my papyrus storage facility, and my uh, sort of uh, the, the, the notes I've written on. And for my phone, I've got an app where I can uh, you know, check at any time and get graphs of the temperature and humidity for my paper and that kind of thing. So uh, I, I live in Alabama now, and I'm very worried about the humidity actually. Alabama has a lot of humidity. But New Orleans would also be kind of a problem. So you can also do things like send the paper to a salt mine, right? That's sort of like how they call uh, the store film, film stock, that kind of thing. So you can do something to the salt mine. Uh, the places I've looked at, it's like, well, call us for an estimate. That's never a good, never a good sign. So, uh, and the other thing is, I want my paper to, to be to be here. And then the other thing is, I want to try to figure out how to do this on a budget. So right now, I've, I haven't been really too worried about the budget. Okay, so I was like, all right, I'll spend a little money. It's a lot cheaper than, you know, playing around with fountain pens is a lot cheaper than buying a boat or something. Uh, and as I'm trying to figure it out, I'm willing to spend 
a little bit of money, but I'm, I'm, I want to try to figure out what's like a low cost way of doing this. And how can you do it for, uh, for fifty dollars or something like that? So, uh, so these are the sorts of things I'm, I'm thinking about, and. Uh, the, then there's another issue, which is, well, this is fine for my research notes, but what about for, you know, the code that I have? What do you do with the code that you write? Well, is it fortunately or unfortunately, depending on who you talk to, you know, I do all my work in Scheme or Racket, and in those languages you tend to write things like domain-specific languages using macros, similarly to the closure. And that means that um, I can often get very good compression ratios for my code. So as I was thinking about it, sort of all the projects I've worked on for the last 13 years as a researcher, you could probably take all of that code and you know, probably squeeze it into 5,000 lines or a few. Okay. So at that point, you can actually print it out. So this, for example, is a printout on my paper uh, of microcanon, which is sort of the core of this new thing that I should work on. This you know, fits on these two pages. Now, what sort of ink do you use? Like, you know, so you could try to print it out with a laser printer, right? Uh, and I have like a laser jet printer, and, and that actually uses carbon toner, so you think it's very stable. However, there seem to be problems where uh, with aging and as the humidity changes for the paper, and basically the paper is being stressed as it becomes more and less humid, hotter and then cooler, the paper fibers are expanding and contracting. And the, the carbon that lays on top, the, the, the toner that lays on top of the paper can start flaking off. So that's a possible failure. And uh, so the, the people who really care about longevity with printing are, are people who do things like fine art prints and they want them to be archival. And so those people are, are pretty serious about it. And what they do is they use inkjet printers. So what this is, uh, this is printed on, uh, with an Epson, a relatively inexpensive Epson printer. And the reason I got that particular printer is not because I care about inkjet printers or Epson printers, but because you can get special ink. So there's one person in the world who makes this ink, which is the carbon ink that I have for my thought. It's basically a similar formula, although, um, once again, I'm paranoid because they changed the formula to version 1.1 because the supplier couldn't couldn't handle something. So that makes me very nervous, and that sounds like something that should be mass spec. But this, um, so this ink should be very similar in composition to the ink from my fountain pens. This should last tens of thousands of years, unless they're doing something funny or something weird on the binder. Uh, so, so this is part of the idea is that you know I can go from from digital to analog and preserve at least the things I care about most. Uh, and then you can go the other way. So I also got a scanner, a flatbed scanner, and so now I scan all my notebooks and now I have digital copies of those. So I, I want to kind of you know, do bi-directional uh, everything. So I want digital copies of everything, I want analog copies of everything on very high quality artifacts. Uh, another thing that I've, I've started getting into is making my own paper. Uh, so, so with my parents, uh, I started making my own 100% cotton uh, paper, and, talk to you about how you do that. It's actually not very difficult. So this is 100% cotton paper. And you can make your own. Once again, this is a way to both learn about these technologies that we often take for granted, but also to try to control the ingredients. And just, you know, it's, it's just interesting to, to learn about uh, paper, the history of paper, and so forth. Uh, and, and be able to try to, to control uh, the media that you're using. I've also started doing some pottery. My, my mom does pottery, so we started doing some pottery. And I've, I've seriously considered trying to make my own sort of clay tablets and things like that. I've also looked into you know, like fused uh, quartz glass and that kind of thing. And, you know, uh, and I'm interested in nanotechnology, and so I'm building a scanning tunnel -like microscope. And there's a you can run that in atomic force mode, um, and so you can move atoms around. So maybe at some point you know, can do kind of a nanotech uh, version of things, but you know, so, so this, is, this is something I want to work on for a very long time. Uh, but it, but it's also just extremely interesting because you can start getting into 
uh, failure modes of medieval manuscripts, for example. So this is a, a book, Introduction to Manuscript Studies, which I highly recommend. So if you want to check it out, I can show you. But it's like full of all of the ways that uh, manuscripts kind of go back, right? and how you fix them, how you recognize them, how you store them, and so forth. So there's this whole um, area of knowledge that humans have accumulated having to do with the preservation of analog artifacts that we know can last for a very, very long period of time. Uh, but I don't think we know how to do that for digital artifacts. Not, not very well. We're still trying to figure that out. And we're in this uh, danger period until we do figure it out of losing a lot of our history. So, <clears throat> uh, the other part of this is well, great. Let's say that we come up with some relatively inexpensive uh, ways to preserve you know, things like research notes or code uh, you know, or, or things that we care about, right? That we want to preserve for posterity. And particularly as a programming language designer, you know, someone who designs programming systems, I want to record that information uh, for myself in the future and for other people to try to give people some context of what, what were we trying to do, why did we make those decisions. Um, so, so that's great. However, there's another aspect of it, which is you know, how, do you, how do you organize this knowledge? Okay, so I've been, I've been spending my nights like scanning old notebooks. Okay? So I've got, I have probably hundreds of notebooks, research notebooks, going back uh, for, for quite a long time, all written on paper of dubious quality, with ink of dubious quality. So trying to scan all those things. Okay, so now I have all of these JPEG images, 600 DPI JPEG images. What do we do with it? And as it's sort of more generally, if you think about how our knowledge is spread out, so where, where do I have knowledge captured? So I've got notes on my phone, I've got notes on my computer, I have like random Emacs files, I tried, tried messing around with like word mode, I can never figure out how that's supposed to work. And I've got like, you know, very many scripts of documents written in LaTeX. I've got drafts of books. I've got stuff in GitHub. I've got stuff in Bitbucket. I have book bookmarks in my browsers, in different browsers. I have YouTube playlists. Right? If you think about that, that's a way to capture knowledge. Of all the YouTube videos that currently exist, here are the videos that I'm most interested in, or here are how I'm going to organize them. So here's a fun thing about the YouTube playlists. So I've got some YouTube playlists, like, for example, music I like to listen to while I'm programming. Okay, great. Uh, so sometimes an, an account goes away, or a video gets taken down, and then the YouTube playlist just has a video removed. It doesn't have the title of the video, right? It's gone. So this is actually a hole in my knowledge. So I've got all of these bits of information spread out all over the place, and I have no way to search over those, really, to organize them, to archive them, or whatever. So the, the sort of next stage in what I'm doing is trying to, in addition to develop better uh, technologies and techniques for uh, refine sort of the practices that I've, I've come up with uh, for, for my own personal uh, analog preservation, I'm also trying to figure out, well, how do we organize this knowledge? Or how do I want to organize my knowledge personally? So you know, one of the things I currently use is a program called TiddlyWiki, which is actually you know, a decent, a decent program. Um, and so this, I have a whole bunch of notes in TiddlyWiki as well, and it has some, you know, some linking and, and tags and things like that. But but I also find it's like it, it just it doesn't meet my needs. And uh, after talking to lots of my friends, and, you know, many of my friends pointed out that actually there's a lot of interface work that went into something like TiddlyWiki, and this is absolutely true. Okay, so, so something like Tiddly, Tiddly Wiki is both great and, uh, it, and, I, and I shouldn't underestimate the amount of time that it took to develop a nice, nice interface. At the same time, uh, as someone who is a programmer and someone who has particular needs, it's the same thing, same reason I use Lisp. The reason I use Lisp is that Lisp is a recognition that whoever designed the programming language doesn't know the program as well as you do. So therefore, you may have to do things like change the language or create a new language to solve your particular problem. That's a very powerful way. To so, you know, TiddlyWiki is great. However, TiddlyWiki is not 
designed to solve my particular problems. And I can mess around with it in JavaScript and try to make it work the way I want, but instead, I've decided I'm going to build something from the ground up, and in fact, I'm going to probably build many of these things to try to explore. Uh, but I've decided, like, you know, if I actually want to be serious about this, I'm going to have to take the ownership of this problem and try to do better than just have all my knowledge spread out various devices, various computers, bookmarks, you know, places where I don't even necessarily think of knowledge organization like YouTube playlists. That, that represents um, my organization of my knowledge. So that's, that's a project that I'm, that I'm working on seriously. And I guess, uh, you know, sort of the, in that part of it, I guess what I'd say is, if this interests you, I, uh, you know, I, I'll very much happily share everything I know. In fact, I'm going to create, I guess, a website or something. I don't know. You know, this is an ironic thing, right? Like, I guess I'll create a GitHub page to share, you know, the practices, right? You know, it's like, okay, I guess, I guess, you know, the practices are ephemeral, right? And the technology we use is ephemeral, but we want the data to last a long time. So, you know, that's, that's the idea is that anything we do is just kind of a snapshot and we're going to have to keep, keep working on improving it. But uh, if you're interested in this, I'm happy to share everything I know. I've got samples of all sorts of stuff you can play with. And you know, there's actually a really nice fountain pen store around the corner, which I saw ran into yesterday. It turned out to be an expensive mistake. <laughs> but, but if you're interested in this, you know, we can we can even take like a field trip there. And, uh, I kind of kind of show you stuff. Uh, but the other part is is sort of the digital organization. How do we design that? So I've read a whole lot about things like uh, the neighbor bushes as we think and you know like Engelbart's work and you know, Ted Nelson's work and you know all these people who are interested in uh, trying to organize knowledge in, in sophisticated ways and there's there's been a lot more recent work also. Uh, but but now at the point where it's like okay I, I'm just gonna have to start building things and what I build is probably gonna look kind of weird because it's gonna be for me, but maybe over time uh, we can figure out ways to to build things that are useful more generally, or at least find ways of building specific tools that are useful to people. So, so I think I think we need to do that. And if you are not, if you're not somehow recording the things that you're doing, the design decisions you're making, uh, whatever you're you're thinking about, I would encourage you to do that and, and, and to try to save that. Right? And it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be super fancy. It could, be, it could be simple, but, but even if you're, you're doing it on sucky paper with sucky ink, right? At least there's a chance that at some point you can scan it, or actually even sucky paper today tends to last quite a long time. So, so it's much better to record it than not. And if you don't do that, then the, the future is going to be, I think, uh, horror. Right? So, so there's this very interesting book called Playing at the World by John Peterson. He's a researcher who's interested in the history of Dungeons and Dragons. So he's written this like 722 page book on the history of Dungeons and Dragons, and then he has a blog. And he finds all of these documents. So he's a collector. He's found all of these original design documents with the original campaigns for Dungeons and Dragons and the original character uh, sheets and things like that. And you can track over time how the game changed and how different people had different ideas of how the game should work. Right? And in fact, I didn't really understand advanced Dungeons and Dragons rules from 1977 to 80 or whatever uh, that I grew up with until I saw those sheets. I was like, oh, that's the sort of campaign that I'm running. Right? So, so this is an example with Dungeons and Dragons, but you can also see this with programming language design. There's this series of conference history of programming languages, Hopple. Okay? So there's three Hopples. Hopple 4 is coming up. Um, and so there's hopefully going to be many more Hopples. And if you haven't read Hopple, I, you know, any of the proceedings, I've recommended Apple 1 and 2 are just completely fascinating to me. I love it. And so, uh, as a programming language designer, I want to start capturing sort of the intent and the ideas and the design decisions and the context or anything like that. So the things I've made, because for, for Minicanon, for example, uh, we didn't do that. So now it's sort of like, oh, how did we come up with that? I don't really remember. So we kind of have to make up stories. So if you're designing things, and I'm sure you're, you're making some decisions, something in your life, something you're building, I would encourage you to write that down and, and save it. Don't fill up notebooks and throw them away. And then save it and maybe scan it or whatever. And then you know, there's a whole set of other practices which are, well, what do you do with this information? Right? What do you do if you get hit by a bus? What do you, you, know, what do you make public? 
you know, because there are things in my notebooks where it's like maybe I'm talking about the ideas with someone else and, and I don't want to scoop them unintentionally by putting it online. Or maybe, you know, I've written something about a paper that sounds like it's a nasty tone just you know, kind of to myself. So, you know, there's also a whole set of practices of, of what do you make available, when do you make it available, and so forth. But there's a long tradition of this in sort of the humanities and libraries. That kind of thing. Right? So, uh, I think it's important as people who design things that we think very hard about uh, what's going to be the future of the decisions we make. Will people be able to recover that information? What can we do now to try to help? And also, well, there are all these giants in the field of organizing knowledge, and you know, there are people like Ingmar and Lick Leiter and. Uh, uh, Ted Nelson and all these folks who did fantastic work, but I think there's too much of a feeling like, okay, now you go read a book about it, right? The good old days or something like that, instead of, well, we need to we need, we need to learn the history, but we also need to be building modern versions of these things for ourselves. And uh, I, I do feel like uh, for the programming languages I enjoy, those were all languages designed by the designers of language for themselves for their own purposes. Right? And so I would like to see more systems being designed for the users themselves. You know? So whatever system I design, it's not going to be like tiddlywinky. It's going to be for my own needs. Uh, but I think that's, that's one way to try to explore the space much more and, and try to come up with, with new approaches. And I think, I think we desperately need it. So anyway, you know, I guess my basic message is because we are living in this hybrid analog uh, uh, digital world, we're kind of in the worst of both worlds, I think. Because we're not paying serious attention to the analog things we build or make or record, and we're also not, we haven't figured out how to do uh, digital preservation, and just putting it on the web or whatever, or putting it in the cloud is just totally insufficient. So, you know, learn about the Internet Archive. Learn about you know, archival practices, look at you know, libraries, look at these sorts of things, and think deliberately about you know, how long do you think this, the, uh, the decisions you're making or the artifacts you're making, how long will they last? You know, what, what can we do to try to make sure that we can capture history so that 5,000 years from now, when people have forgotten English, but they kind of put the parts together, they could actually recover something about what it's like to be here in 0-2018. All right, that's it. that uh, if you want to be serious about these sorts of time scales, uh, you have to think about the very serious possibility that people will forget English, right? And English will have to be rediscovered. Uh, or the fact that this pot, or sorry, this little clay thing, which I you know, put my name on the bottom, that that inscription of my name will maybe last longer than you know, civilization. will have some sort of terrible scenario before that goes away. Cool. Uh, a lot of great questions here. Uh, I'm going to start with one of mine. Um, so, we're producing a lot of data nowadays. Yeah. And basically, the more we produce, the more time it's going to take to read the data. Yep. And uh, if we all start producing all this data, um, when are we going to ever have time to read it? Why are we going to want it in 5,000 years? It's just going to be exponentially growing. Why would we want this data? Uh, well, why do we want it now? Well, for short term, you know, we want to understand, you know, we want to have a conversation with someone like, what was I thinking two years ago, 10 years ago? 
but in 5,000 years, with millions and billions of people living, and are they going to worry about what you were thinking 5,000 years ago? Uh, well, I guess I guess I have a couple thoughts about it. And that's an obvious problem, right? The, the amount of that, the data we're generating is huge. Uh, so, so obviously, we can't, you know, just do everything on play tablets right now. Big, big tablet. Like, <laughs> we put so, so that's a problem. So, so I think one thing is like, you know, we can be somewhat selective about the things that we consider extremely high value. Like I said, I think you could boil down the last 15 years of my work or 13 years of my work to like 5,000 lines of code or maybe 10,000 lines of code. Uh, so there's certain core ideas that I'm willing to sort of hand curate. These are ideas that I think are particularly important. Things like conversations between people, I don't actually think that information grows that quickly. I mean, I can only send a finite number of emails in a day. I can only, you know, and people used to write huge numbers of letters by hand and stuff like that. You know, so so I think at, at the individual level of me communicating with someone, sure I'm on IM and whatever, but that's that's actually pretty small. And if you look at the heroic efforts that people have done to try to uncover biographical information, like we Robert Caro's magnificent book, The Power Broker, about Robert Moses in New York City. And look at the amount of effort he did to try to uncover what was going on at that time. You know, so, so it's true that uh, most of the data we're collecting, people aren't going to be interested in. It's also true that we're going to have to figure out, well, how do we store these things at all? Uh, fortunately, this, this space, uh, this capacity is still increasing. Uh, but we, we probably at some point have to be a little judicious. But at the same time, I feel like uh, you know, I, I feel like I personally owe it to people in the future not to make that decision for them. That it's like, oh, sorry, we're not going to leave anything for you. It's scorched earth, and uh, you know, sorry, the, the 2018 was the year of uh, you don't you don't get to learn anything about what it's like to zero. Zero 2018. There you go. That's right. Zero zero 2018. So, so you talked about boiling down your academic output to a few thousand points. Um, do you think there's a conflict between the way that we do scientific discourse, where you know you kind of have to get it past peer review and you have to explain all this stuff, but then in the end there's only 3,000 lines that you think would need to be preserved. Is there some conflict in <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think there's some. And, and of course, you know, I, I'm being a little facetious when I say that everything's just 5,000 lines code. I mean, also, <clears throat> we have papers and written books and things like that. Uh, but on the other hand, okay, so so if you really want to know about the work that we've been doing, what you really need to do is look at all the rejected papers that haven't appeared in there. They're on my, they're on my laptop. Rejected, 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 rejected. And see how we change the ideas, see how we, we try to improve them. And maybe the papers got accepted not because the ideas are good, maybe it's just because we presented it in a different way, maybe in a, idea, in a way people could more easily understand it or seem sexy or whatever. So, so actually, what I'm, I'm interested in also is recording all of the stuff that you know uh, never saw the light of day because you know it got rejected. Or, for example, with the book, the recent schema. But the first edition of that book, you know, working with Dan Friedman and all of this, Dan, Dan's uh, motto is. If you're not sure how to write a chapter, if there are two ways to write the chapter, you write it both ways, and then you throw away at least one of the two. Okay? And so we have, you know, that book had 10 chapters in it. We have at least 10 chapters that we threw away that were like finished chapters, okay? And, but those have never shown the light of day, right? so, or never seen the light of day. So uh, I think that's also part of it is you're trying to collect information so the people have more context. So they can see, like, D&D, what were the alternatives? What were the rules people experimented with and rejected, right? So, so I, I want to very seriously think about how to try to capture that. And then the other part is, you know, whenever you're trying to do any sort of uh, curation, there's also the thing of, well, I want to make myself look good. I want to not show all the scummy things. <laughs> you know, I want to show the great stuff that makes me look brilliant. Um, and so I'm also kind of thinking, well, how can I how can I capture like a bigger, more accurate piece where it's sort of like, okay, well, here's all the stuff. Uh, at some point in the future, here's all the stuff. Go through it, come up with your own conclusions. Right? Uh, so that that sort of thing also.
Um, all right, so this is, this is an interesting question. This is from Dr. Sussman. Um, it's, a, it's more of a comment, but I'll make it into a question. Um, so one of the things that is, I think, really interesting about Egypt as a culture was they seem to be very interested in preservation. Uh, the pyramids were just like, was, was make something that would never be destroyed. Uh, you have mummification, so try to make the bodies last forever. Um, and they didn't care so much. I mean, I guess the papyrus was pretty good, but we don't have so many dope, right? Because it's paper. Um, but what about new technologies for like encoding stuff in genomes? This is from mm. Dr. Sussman. Yeah. And you know, making something that will make its own copies, reproduce, and be around. Sure. Hopefully, you know, a little longer. Yeah. So a couple a couple of thoughts there. So so one is yes, Egypt was interested in preserving things, but we should also you know think about the Sumerians and the Babylonians. So the Babylonians had Egyptian DNA, right? In the month. Like they were able to yeah. we could clone an Egyptian king. <laughs> and your words, not mine. <laughs> they made it, is what I'm saying. You know. <laughs> Uh, well, okay, so, so the Egyptians were interested in preservation, the uh, Babylonians and Sumerians were also extremely interested in preservation, and it, actually the first, the first archivists and librarians were from Mesopotamia, as far as I can tell, and uh, they actually, you know, so, so uh, Babylonian, which had two dialects, it's, or sorry, uh, Akkadian has two dialects, Babylonian and Assyrian, uh, so, so the scribes in Akkadian uh, were writing in a system that used both Akkadian words and Sumerian words. Sumerian is a totally different language than Akkadian. Uh, so they had to study Sumerian. So you had these people creating uh, you know, dictionaries of Sumerian and things like that. You know, thousands of years ago, they were interested in trying to capture linguistic knowledge. And trying, here's, here's how Sumerian was, right? And they had libraries and archives and things like that. You know, many thousands of years ago. So, so this isn't just a, a recent thing. Uh, as far as new technologies, things like DNA. Also, so there's actually a big project uh, that Microsoft has sponsored, where they have a whole bunch of DNA that they're sequencing to encode data. So the idea that the DNA, uh, if it's you know dried and kept in a nice environment, is actually extremely stable, will last a very long time. You can put a whole lot of it into small area, and then you could do sequencing, for example, to read that information with very good compression, and you could do you know, error correcting codes and things like that, in case there's some, some sort of chemical reaction with it by cosmic ray or something. So, uh, so, so Microsoft has been very serious about this, and I think they've all signed for $50 million of, of uh, census technology. Here on, on uh, Right, it's like, oh, oh Bill Gates trying to clone himself again. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is like a long-term data storage thing. And then, then there's the other you know, idea of like trying to encode information in a living you know, creature's genome, right? So try to pass that on time. And, and uh, you know, one, one of the things I find, find interesting is you know, there's this idea of how do you uh, tell people, you know, when we're building Yucca Mountain as this you know, uh, repository for highly radioactive waste, how do you tell people in the future after English isn't spoken anymore, um, not to go near this area. How do you how do you tell people ten thousand years from now, don't go in this area? And a whole bunch of architects came up with interesting ideas. But one interesting idea was to uh, genetically engineer cats, so cats would change color when they're near radioactive waste. And then you have like this oral folklore about if the cat changes color, don't go there, right? <laughs> uh, so that's that's uh, one way maybe to to encode uh, knowledge. Uh, um, so so anyway, yeah, I, I think. I think these are, are interesting possibilities. Um, yeah, and so it may be that, but, but you still have the issue, you still have all the issues of, even if the media is gonna last thousands of years, you still have the issue of what do you record, uh, how do you find it, how do you organize that knowledge, privacy issues, you know, when do you release it, you know, how do you, how do you make it easy for people in the future to, get, to, to tell what may be of interest to them? You know, so also uh, Alan Kay and I think one of the students has this has this paper, the Cuneiform Tablets of 2015, where where they tell uh, you know, more of these data loss stories, and then uh, they propose a way uh, using sort of virtual machines and, and uh, 
and various storage media so that people 5,000 years from now could sort of bootstrap small talk or something like that. Not go through all the processes. So it could give you enough information. Here's the virtual machine. Once you have that, then you can run the software on it. Hopefully your computers are faster than today. Whatever. Okay, so, so they also have a story about this. And, and, and the, uh, the great story that's told in that paper, which is a very interesting read, is the story about the Domesday book. You know about the Domesday book in English? In England? It's like after you know, Battle of Hastings and the French uh, conquered England, created this book of all the holdings in England. So, so this book can still be read today. Uh, this, this is, you know, in the 1080s or something like that. The book was created. Uh, and so the, so the BBC decided, apparently in the late 80s, that they were going to create like a modern Domesday book using <laughs> digital technology, right? So they had a special version of the BBC Micro with a special like optical disc thing. And they solicited all, you know, all sorts of entries from people around England to represent the state of England. What it was like to be uh, an English person in the, the 1980s. And, and of course, within a few years, like, you know, no one, no one can do this, the machines were broken. So then, then there was a big preservation effort. Okay, so an academic team got together to try to read this information. They were going to put it on the web. And then they started running out of funding, and the project leader apparently died. And so as of now, like, the website's down. So that, that was a, their example of, OK, so we can read these like, tablets. We can read the Dome State book. But we can't read the archival digital project that the UBC launched. It's just, just a few years ago. Just a few years ago, right? Like a lot. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, moving out of your closet into, I guess, your like oh. office. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, you know, oh, like, I'll show you. <laughs> um, so do you have backups? I mean, is this uh, the kind of thing where like one one fire will yeah yeah, yeah. You know, so there was there was a, a a fire alarm went off in my new apartment and I was like you know, I ran it's outside and I grabbed my laptop bag and I was like I forgot my laptop <laughs> so I go back in is it really a fire or what uh, so that's that's what got me serious about like I've got to scan this stuff <laughs> you know, it's like I'm gonna go all this work and it's like you know a fire is going out or actually water damage my last apartment the the uh, the water heater, like the bottom fell out and flooded my entire apartment and then it got mold. Ooh. So anyway, so this is where I, so that's the closet floor behind. So I, I moved it out of the closet because it's better airflow. So you can see the Wi-Fi station and you can see one of the temperature humidity sensors that's wireless and then you can see like one of the regular temperature humidity sensors and then this my uh, sort of archival box. Yeah, so you can see kind of. So that's one of the temperature sensors and, or, and humidity sensors. And it's 48% relative humidity, 71 degrees, which is too hot. Um, and then you know, inside the box, you know, I've got my special paper. And you know, I also I have, um, you know, this is kind of my storage area for the reams of paper in the future. And I've got a temperature and humidity sensor on that. And you know, a lot of this is, is actually trying to figure out the practices. You know, so I could tell you all the materials, but their practice is like, how do you order this paper? It turns out that all the paper that's 100% uh, cotton isn't the same quality. Okay, so I like the Strathmore paper, but maybe they have to stop making something. Right? That's one problem. But another problem is, well, if you want to get this shipped, first of all, the paper's not cheap, but if you get it shipped, well, guess what? They pack it, usually it's packed, Amazon or Paper Mill or wherever you order it, all the places I've seen, they just put it in a, 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 a cardboard box. And what ends up happening is the cardboard box, the, the corners get smashed in during shipping. So that stack of paper on top, those are all pieces of paper that are basically unusable because they've been folded so much in shipping. So stuff like that. So what did I do? Well, I had the bright idea that I'd order three reams, so the ream in the middle at least would be usable. You know, but, but that's like not the best long-term option. Right? So, so a lot of it's just figuring out stupid stuff like that. Like, how do I get paper? Where the edges aren't like all crushed in already, or or maybe I figure out how to uncrush it or something. So, you know, uh, I, I watched an awesome YouTube video last night, which was uh, seven ways to hide a lavalier microphone for people like you know doing film industry stuff. Like seven different ways to thread a mic through like a shirt to hide it, right? And so this is an example of well, you can have the lavalier microphone, you can have tape, but there's a whole set of practices that people build up over time, right? And it's the same thing here. Actually, most of my effort is, is trying to figure out what are the set of practices that are useful. Like, how do I, uh, you know, refill my pens in the best way, or how do I, 
uh, make sure that my paper doesn't get exposed to my, actually I had like a mold emergency, possible mold emergency where it like rained nonstop in Alabama and I left my archival notebook in my laptop bag that was soaking wet for like a week. And by the time I pulled it out, it had this really weird smell. I was like, oh, better scan that. And now I've got an isolation area. And I put it in my freezer, <laughs> froze it, <laughs> right, to try to fill it. Anyway, so like all, all sorts of stuff like that that I'm, I'm trying to figure out, right? Or like, what's the right way to do? I'll give you one more thing. Like, do you uh, have do you have backups that aren't digital? Like, I, I, I'm thinking of like. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So that's why I got this printer. Right? Okay. So the reason I got the printer. Yeah. Oh yeah, so here are my fade tests, my window exposure tests, by the way, so you can tell how the inks do. Oh yeah, so yeah, so here's here's like a, uh, another test, by the way. So this is this is a uh, uh, with a special Eps, uh, Epson printer and a special ink. So I printed out this page, and then this is from a fountain pen, and then I soaked this paper in paper and water and tried to smear it to see how well it actually stood up pretty well. But yeah, so this is you know now the idea with that paper, so the the, the printer, I uh, actually can print that out and then I can scan it again and print it back out. So this is like a scan of me printing out a digital document, right? So I want to have this workflow where now that I've scanned all my documents, all my notebooks in, I'm going to print them all out. So I'll have another physical background and maybe I'll send that to the salt mine. Maybe you just have a printer in the salt mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, but you're right. Like how do, you know, I, I don't have any trust in sort of right, digital stuff. I'm thinking so. like, you know, Literacy during the dark ages, it was, it was scribes just copying and copying all the time. Yeah. They preserved it. That's right. If, 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 uh, if you haven't read a canticle for Leibowitz, yeah. uh, that's that's like inspirational re uh, reading. <laughs> that and 70s and Anathema. Uh, and you'll see them somewhere else. Uh, and before we break for lunch, what what are the big hopes that you have for its digital preservation? Oh, this is this is me water testing. Um, I've got I've got like I've got like a thousand photos and videos. Uh, was that? Oh yeah, are the photos. Are, yeah, I can show you a picture of me that's faded. Oh. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. What, what's, yeah. You you started talking about digital preservation at the end of your yeah, talk, yeah. but you said you still have to like get into that. What, what, well, do, you, what do your hopes? So, so I've gotten in, I mean, okay, so this, for many, 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 many years, as long as I can remember, I've been frustrated by trying to organize my information, index cards, and zillion other ways, and, and I've never been very successful. Well, I, I think maybe it's just, ultimately, I'll never be super successful. I was super happy with what I come up with, like I can come up with something better than the current ways of organizing things. Um, and I've, I've been extremely interested in new media studies, and extremely interested in uh, digital preservation and reading about knowledge organization and you know the Niebuhr Bush's work and you know, Engelbart and all this stuff, uh, Nelson and all these people. And but now I'm at the point where where I've just decided I'm going to have to to, to build my own system. And uh, one of the reasons I've kind of gotten this confidence is that now I'm working on this uh, project for the uh, National Institutes of Health with uh, with Greg Rosenblatt and and uh, Matt Might. And to call Precision Medicine Institute at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and we've, we've been building our own biomedical reasoning system uh, from scratch. We were originally just going to take some off the shelf stuff or cobble some stuff together, and we're actually building it entirely from scratch. Uh, and actually, we're using mini camera and logic programming and things like that. And the system is actually only a few thousand lines of code. We, once again, we've been able to, to try to keep it very, very small. Uh, to try to do sophisticated things through having the language stack on the other stuff like that. So, and and uh, been building interfaces for that. So I'm very much in this kind of mindset of both um, trying to build reasoning tools and knowledge organization tools and things like that, but also <clears throat> thinking about interface, thinking about how people use this, watching people use these tools, and and just you know coming to the conclusion that you know. No one can build the tool I need better than I can. That's why I learned how to become a part of it. So that's what I'm going to do. And it may not be useful to anyone else, but it's going to be useful to me eventually. Maybe not tomorrow, but it will be. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you.